Hello again, everybody. So, to this point, we've gone through and we've discussed quite a bit about the thermodynamics of solution formation. We've attempted to quantify the factors that go into determining whether or not if you dissolve a particular salt in water, you're going to get an endothermic result, so the solution feels cold, or if you get an exothermic result, and the solution feels warm to your touch. In this video, we're going to go through the issue of temperature effects. You know from experience that if you heat solutions up or you, you cool them down, that has an effect on the solubility of the solute that you're trying to dissolve. And I show here two different slides. The one up here shows a bunch of different solids being dissolved in water and how their solubility trends with temperature. And the one down over here shows you how some different um, gases are affected by temperature and their solubility. So we know we've got two results, endothermic or exothermic, when it comes to the solution making process. What we want to try to do is understand up here, and we'll start with the solid chart. Up here on the solid chart, you see that most solids trend in the direction that kind of makes sense when it comes to temperature effect. Right? It sort of makes sense that the solubility goes up as you increase the temperature. Right? You increase the temperature, there's more thermal energy in the system, so it kind of seems like it makes sense that you should be able to dissolve more stuff. But over here on gases, you see that the solubility drops when it comes to increasing the temperature along that x-axis. Let's see if we can understand both of these phenomena. All right, I'm going to start again with the solids up here. So I'm going to pick one of the solids on the chart. Let's say, um, how about e, maybe the KCL, okay? It doesn't have a dramatic temperature effect, but KCL is a small enough formula for me to draw in here. So when you dissolve KCL in water, can you write that chemical equation down? What's the chemical reaction for dissolving KCL in water? Hopefully you'll come up with something like this. KCL solid plus water, and I'm going to draw this as an equilibrium because it's going to be a dynamic system. Now what am I going to draw on the right hand side of this reaction arrow? How do I represent KCL being dissolved in water? Well, obviously it turns into its ions and they are in now the aqueous phase, right? They are forming ion-dipole interactions with the water, so they're in the aqueous phase. So here's the question. KCl, we see that its solubility goes up a little bit as we increase temperature. So is that indicative of an endothermic or an exothermic heat of solution? Or put more generally, all these blue lines that go up as temperature increases, are all of those representing endo or exothermic heats of solution? And these couple of red lines, are they exo or endothermic? Let's see if we can rationalize this through. So the solubility goes up for the blue lines as we increase the temperature. Now when you increase the temperature, what effectively are you adding to the reaction system? You're adding heat. And now we can think of heat as being a reactant or a product, and we can try to understand this from a Le Chatelier's principle perspective. So if it's true that the solubility is going up as we add heat, then that must tell us that as we add heat, we are favoring the right-hand side of the reaction. So in a Le Chatelier sense, it must be true then that the heat is a reactant, right? It belongs on the left-hand side of that reaction arrow because as you add heat through increasing the temperature, you are favoring the system towards having, whoops, towards uh, increasing the solubility. Oh, sorry about that. Towards increasing the solubility. So KCl, KBr, NaBr, NaNO3, all of those in blue that you see there, they must have an endothermic heat of solution. And most solid solutes are, in fact, endothermic. That example of lithium chloride that I've alluded to in previous videos, that's actually a, a rare exception where the result is exothermic. Okay? 
So here, right, the solubility is dropping down, so that must tell us that heat is a product because as we add heat by increasing the temperature, we shift away from the dissolved ions in that case, right? So if the solubility goes up with temperature, then that tells you you have an endothermic heat of solution, okay? Let's take a look over here then at gases. We see that all gases appear to have a exothermic heat of solution, right? Their solubility drops, and in some cases noticeably drops, as we increase the temperature. Let's take oxygen as our standard, standard example for the gases here. When I dissolve oxygen in water, can I write that chemical reaction? So, O2 gas plus liquid water goes to form. Now, when oxygen dissolves in water, what happens to it chemically? Well, the answer is actually nothing. It's still O2, right? We don't break any bonds of that molecular compound. It's just now in the aqueous phase. So we don't do any bond breaking like we do for a salt down here, okay? When we dissolve oxygen in water, it's still molecular oxygen. There's still two O's there bound to each other. So it turns out, based on the trend, that it must be true that gases have an exothermic heat of solution. The heat is on the right-hand side. Now, let's see if we can understand this. Let's see if this makes sense. So as you increase the temperature, the solubility of the gas is going down. It's kind of like you're forcing the gas out of the solution. And if we think about our um, H1, H2, H3 stuff or our uh, H1 and heat of hydration analysis from previous videos, this should make a little bit of sense, okay? So oxygen in water will start off with some energy. The question is, when we do an H1 and heat of hydration analysis, what's going to happen? Well, what is the magnitude of H1 expanding the solute for a gaseous solute? So if I start here, how much H1 do I have? How high do I increase the energy of the system when I'm trying to expand the solute? Well, if it's a gas solute, that H1 jump is almost negligible because it's a gas solute. It's already expanded. You don't have to break up the gas molecules from each other in order to expand a gas because it's already a gas. So H1 basically doesn't go up at all. So there's really no H1 factor. And then, what did we say about hydration enthalpies? What sign do they always have? Hydration enthalpies are always negative. They always lower the energy of the system because we're allowing for interactions now to occur. So here's my energy of my separate gas and my water. I do an H1. Basically, I don't go up at all. And then I do my heat of hydration, and I come down. So that explains why all gases have an exothermic heat of solution. It's because they have no H1 contribution. Meanwhile, over here on solids, it seems like that everything ends up being, or most things end up being, endothermic. So we go up for H1 in a noticeable way. Then when we hydrate, we come down, but we never come down far enough to get below where we initially started, at least, again, in most cases. All right? So even though the energy of the system has gone up as we make the solution, it is still possible to make the solution because don't forget, we have the entropy factor, right? The entropy of all of these processes here, right, that entropy is very much a positive contributor. So it's really the entropy that's helping make the solution when it comes to trying to dissolve solids uh, in water. All right, so hopefully this helps explain temperature effects and solubility, whether or not the solution is endothermic in the cases of most of the of the blue lines up here or if it's exothermic in the cases of all gaseous solutes. Where are we headed next? Next we're actually going to spend some time talking about gaseous solutes and how we can quantify how much gas is dissolved in your solution. That's all for now.